Hi, I'm Tom Landry. I'm here to interview Mr. Brian Brumbaugh for the Northwest Diving History Association. Brian has been a key player in the diving history of, of the Pacific Northwest ever since the 50s. And so we're going to have a little interview with him and let him tell, tell us his story. Brian, what inspired you to get involved with diving? Well, I had the unique opportunity of being born uh, into a family that was already diving when, when uh, I was born. And so I, I actually grew up in it. Uh, my brother-in-law, who was dating my sister, which is 15 years older than me when I was born, had already started free diving and had um, gone to work for one of the two first dive stores in the Pacific Northwest called Puget Sound Divers on Westlake in Seattle. It was... When was that? That was uh, 1951, um, I believe, 50 or 51. Uh, it was owned by a, a man by the name of Dave LeClaire who owned a commercial fishing boat manufacturing company and they took the front part of, of that facility and made a dive store out of it. And it was made initially to, to supply diving equipment for his wife who wanted to dive and there was no uh, equipment available, and so they opened a store and, uh, and started a club um, called Puget Sound Divers, excuse me, called Puget Sound Mud Sharks, which was a competitive spearfishing club. At the same time in Seattle, there was a dive store that opened up on, uh, in West uh, Seattle called uh, West Seattle Divers, Seattle Skid Divers, excuse me, and that was owned by Frank Wolf, and he and, and Puget Sound Divers were the first stores in the early uh, early 50s. Um, now, you probably should mention in, in this interview that your brother-in-law is Gary Kepler, owner of Underwater Sports. Owner of Underwater Sports. He was the manager of Puget Sound Divers from 1954 to 1959, and left in 59 and opened Puget, or excuse me, Underwater Sports on uh, Roosevelt Way in 1960, um, stayed there until 1965, and then moved to Boat Street on Lake Union, um, and stayed there until 1972, and purchased uh, the third uh, oldest diving business, which was uh, Marker Buoys in on uh, Aurora. They originally were, were started in the mid-50s in uh, Ballard. Yeah, Frank and Alma Miller were the, the owners of, of that particular store. Now, you mentioned the Mud Sharks. <coughs> Tell us a little bit about the Mud Sharks. Mud Sharks were a competitive spirit fishing com uh, club. Um, they were one of the rivals in, in, in the country on, on, uh, on the amount of trophies that they won. It was, this, this was three-person competitive spirit fishing meets that... that we had many of in the 50s and 60s. Who, who were the members of the Mud Sharks? Well, there were lots of different members. Uh, you usually ran a membership of about uh, 40 people uh, at all times, but it was uh, it was really founded by the very first divers in the Pacific Northwest. Um, one was a, a Jim Blanchard who uh, came from Everett, Bill Mertz, um, Gary Kepler was, was certainly part of it, but he, he wasn't one of the founding members of it. Uh, through the, the middle of the, the 50s, there was an offshoot. A number of people left the Mud Sharks and started um, a, a, a different company called the Black, not company, but dive club called the Blackfish. And there was a real rivalry between the Blackfish and, and the Mud Sharks. And which group are you involved with? The Mud Sharks. And obviously the Mud Sharks and the Blackfish were competitive spearfishing clubs. Predominantly. And you went out, you would go out and compete in, in competitions and... They were breath holding competitions. It was, um, the meets were anywhere from four to five hours. Uh, it was uh, the weight of, of the accumulation of fish that, that you spearfished during that period of time. Uh, you had three man teams and you weighed up um, the weight from from all three members, and whoever had the most won the meet. And this went on year-round? It, it, it did go on year-round. There was there was uh, set meets that were at the same time each year. Uh, in the middle of January, there was one that was in Deception Pass, for example, called the Winter Meet. And then you also had elimination meets to be able to compete in national tournaments. 
uh, National Spearfishing Tournaments, and they consisted of uh, four to six meets, uh, and the top three people, uh, and this was all of the clubs that, that competed against each other. It was individual competition, and the top three would then represent the state of Washington in the National Spearfishing Championships. Okay, so that brings us up to wh where are we at? We're probably, uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that went on in the 60s, but, you know, it was just the evolution of diving. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, your days um, with Ted Griffin. Well, we had a... Uh, we had an active uh, involvement in the catching of, of uh, all of the killer whales in captivity except six. There were two in, in Vancouver that were caught by the Vancouver Aquarium. Why don't you, let me stop you. Why don't you tell us who Ted Griffin was at first? T Ted Griffin was um, an entrepreneur who, who purchased an aquarium from Ivor Hagland on Pier 56 in about 1960. And uh, it was a, a public aquarium uh, at the end of the dock. And if anybody doesn't know who Ivor Hagelin was, it's Ivor's Seafood Restaurants. Uh, he was quite a character in, in uh, Seattle marine history. Um, Ted, starting about 1962, had a desire of, of, of catching killer whales. Now, what kind of got him into it is he was the first person to catch a six-scaled shark in, in uh, Puget Sound. And the first one he caught was 17 feet long, uh, caught in about 250 feet of water, straight out in front of the, uh, the aquarium at Pier 56. He caught, through a summer, four or five of them that would live for uh, not a very long period of time in the aquarium because they were deep water fish. But I think the largest one was 23 feet. This brought a tremendous amount of, of people to the aquarium. And so he came up with the idea of wanting to catch a killer whale. And he tried multiple ways of doing it. Um, he tried uh, tranquilizing them from helicopters, um, catching them from helicopters. Um, he, um, he failed reasonably miserably for several years. Um, in 1966, I think it was 65 or 66. Namu was, was caught by um, some fishermen in, just outside of Namu, British Columbia. And Namu was a uh, female with a calf. And uh, they, the net, these, these fishermen had put out their net, and the net collapsed against a rock, and the killer whales were in the inside of it. And th it was well known that, that uh, Ted was looking to buy a, a uh, killer whale. And, these fishermen got a hold of him. He flew up to Namu and purchased the whales without having any ability to get them back, which was kind of a unique, um, a unique problem. Uh, a local radio personality by the name of Bob Hardwick owned a small tugboat and um, volunteered to pull them back. And so they went up and made a giant cage out of, uh, out of netting and 50-gallon barrels stuck the whales in it, hooked up the, uh, the, um, the tugboat, and made about one and a half knots an hour. And they figured that the, the animals would probably die of starvation before they could get them back. So Foss, Tug, and, and Barge came up and, uh, and started, the, uh, started the haul. Gary Keffler was, was flown up to uh, do diving on, on the, uh, the pen on the way back and stayed for three weeks uh, on the boat, bringing it back to Seattle. Did he dive in the cage with the whales? He did dive. Well, I don't know that he was in the inside. He was on the outside a lot because it was picking up kelp and, and um, driftwood and stuff like that that had to be cleared away so that they could, they could keep going without pushing the stuff through the water. I, I'm not sure that he actually was in the inside of, the, uh, of that one. The, the male bull followed the, uh, the two down as far as Deception Pass. Then finally, at Deception Pass turned around and, and left and, and never came back. The female um, was let loose, and uh, uh, the, the adolescent, you might say, which was 19 feet long, wasn't really an adolescent, was housed in the Seattle Marine Aquarium for a year uh, in the summertime, and then went to Rich Passage uh, uh, by Port Orchard and was housed in a uh, little cove there. It was also used in the, uh, the movie Namu the Killer Whale that Ivan Torres filmed in, in uh, San Juan Island at, at Roach Harbor. 
uh, it was a major motion picture. So what was your involvement then with Ted in the Catching of the Killer Whales? Well, after, uh, after we had the first one, there was a, a, a tremendous desire by aquariums to have killer whales. And so uh, Ted took on a partner by the name of Don Goldsberry, who was the curator of the Point Defiance uh, Aquarium. He, he was, had been an active fisherman also and knew the, uh, uh, the fishing people of Gig Harbor. And they hired uh, two different companies that were purse-sainers to go out and attempt to purse-sain um, killer whales that came into to Puget Sound, uh, and, and of which they would have to, have to drive them, not unlike you drive cattle, into shallow bays where the net could go to the bottom and wouldn't have too much current. Uh, divers were then used to uh, secure the nets, put anchors out. We'd be in the inside of the nets also. Um, and then they had a procedure of lassoing the killer whales, at which time divers would get in the water and put um, ropes around the tails. Uh, you'd have a rope around uh, the front of the whale, and then it would be tied off and picked up and put onto uh, a fishing boat and either taken to directly to the aquarium or taken to a boat launching ramp where a truck would come and pick it up and, and drive it to the boat launching ramp. We caught approximately 38 that way. And your job was what? One, one of the divers. And yeah. and you did you get into the tank with the whales? Absolutely. And uh, helping the whales in distress and we we uh, our procedure for for whales that got caught in that was just to cut them loose and turn them loose. Uh, and so yeah, we, we did that. Um, it was uh, all of the di you know part. A major portion of the catch was the diver being in the water and putting a rope around the tail. So, and how long did you do this for? We did it um, until 1975. And where was this at? This was all in Puget Sound. All over Puget Sound. Yep. South Sound all the way up through. Well, South Sound. The, the uh, furthest we ever went was um, the bay just before Deception Pass, um, Penn Cove. Yeah, Pen Pen Cove is the furthest we went. There were a number of times in Yukon Harbor, uh, just just by Manchester, uh, Henderson Bay in in uh, Gig Harbor was um, three or four times. Killer whales were, were very predictable. They would be in the same place at the same time each year, so they would come back, for example, and be in Henderson Bay the third week of January. So we'd be ready to fish the third week of January. They'd also come back in August. And so uh, after we, we realized that, we, we would be in these places when they came. And who, who did you work with in those days catching those kill, catch, when you're catching killer whales? Well, I, Some of the names. Well, um, Don Goldsberry and Ted Griffin, of course, were the, the owners of the company. The owners of the boat were uh, Pete Babbage um, had one of them, and Adam Ross uh, had the Chinook, and later, later the Dana R. There was Jerry Brown that took part in it, Bill High, who's uh, affiliated with Maui, Gary Kepler, of course, Dale Dean, um, Ted Roethlisberger, uh, Jim McMahon, uh, Peter Ward. Um, a lot of old-time guys. A lot of old-time guys, yeah. <laughs> that was a long time ago. So then what? After um, the Killer Wells was over. Well, I, I had worked in, in my my brother-in-law's store from from uh, 1960 uh, when he first opened up underwater sports um, it, it, it was a unique time even going back into the 50s we, we had at Puget Sound Divers we had a, a large 12-foot tank that we had two attempts to break the uh, record of staying underwater the longest the first one was done by Mac Thompson who later invented the Pisces submarine and he stayed underwater for, for three days and uh, uh, you'd have to eat, sleep, drink, and you had, we did have communications in those days. Um, we put TVs outside the window so they had something to do, but he woke up and, and didn't realize where he was and, and he was about four hours short of breaking the record and broke the surface. And once you break the surface, it's the end of the, end of the program. The other one was uh, in, uh, I think, 1961. It was Del Ross, Del Rossberg, uh, and he did break the record. Um, and that was at a uh, at a uh, grocery store. They, they put the, the tank up in a grocery store. So it was, it, there was a lot of fun things that, that, that happened in those early years. Um, 
Now you're also a NAWI instructor. I, I uh, w worked in the, uh, the, the family business till, till 1972. I became an instructor in 1971 with NAWI um, and was an active instructor throughout the, the entire 70s. Um, I had my own store in, in Everett and in Port Angeles. Um, saw those and went back and, and worked in the family business in underwater sports in Tacoma. Uh, in uh, 1980, I went into the repping business and uh, was a rep in, in the sporting goods and diving business uh, for a number of companies, including U.S. divers. And now what? Well, now I'm not into diving anymore. <laughs> I, I do diving as a sport, but uh, I'm not in the business any longer. I think we're done. Okay.